Richard Dreyfuss tackled his first acting role at the tender age of nine, starring in a Jewish Community Center production. The rest, as they say, is Hollywood history. American Graffiti, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Jaws, Mr. Holland's Opus, and now his latest film, Red, which opened in theaters on October 15th. Okay. Who the hell are you guys? You don't remember us? We remember you. You're the guy that we cleaned up down in Guatemala in 1981. And the question is, who did you fly out of there? <laughs> you don't have any idea what you're getting into. <laughs> First of all, you can't touch me. Sure we can. <laughs> Guess what? The duct tape is off and we are thrilled to share early coffee with Richard Dreyfus. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for the coffee. What oh, was it like to get smacked by Morgan Freeman? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm looking up at Bruce, Morgan, John Malkovich, and uh, um, Helen Mirren is there. And, and I'm thinking, I belong here. <laughs> <laughs> Do anything you want. <laughs> yeah. How many takes did that take? Uh, not many. It was, uh, you know, they know what they're doing. Everyone knows what they're doing. I ha the, it originally had been different, and I had asked, why don't you tie me up? Yeah. And Bruce Willis yeah. later said he'd never heard anyone say that before. You know, tie me up and beat me. Was that the thing that kind of drew you to this, though? I mean, to work with Bruce and, and Helen and Morgan. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's quite a cast. Yeah. You know, it's a very rare thing. I have in essence retired from acting and don't think of it as the center of my life but when you get a chance to do something with people that you so admire you, that's so rare yeah. and they don't write films anymore at all mm -hmm. for actors at all you've been in so many films at this point from jaws to close encounters of the third kind birth of a nation just to name a few. Just to name um, a few. But, but when it comes to all of these different roles, do you have one in your career that really stands out for you? I really don't. I mean, I sometimes lie about it and say I do. But in fact, I, I wanted to be an actor when I was eight, and I wanted the life. I wanted the body of work, and I never lost sleep over a job I didn't get because I wanted the whole thing. And I never took a job for any reason but love. Mm. And then, when I was about 55, I realized that there was something else I loved that, I, that needed tending to, which was America. And so I retired. And then I kept on having to work because I needed the money. Yeah. So I began to work for money. And most people have to work for money. And that was something that was extraordinarily different and painful. If we can, though, if we can kind of go back and, and like I mentioned to you before, Close Encounters, one of my top five favorites of all time. Um, when you're doing a movie like that, or even Jaws for that, it's, do you have any idea that you're kind of, you've stumbled on these, these, I mean, they're classics, both Jaws and Close Encounters, just two. Jaws I didn't think would ever make it out of, you know, it would, was a bust and a failure, and I went on TV and said so. <laughs> what, was there something nice. specific about it that made you think that way? Well, that it trebled its budget and quadrupled its schedule, and the shark never worked, and, <laughs> you know, it would come yeah. up and it, it would It only go, has to work uh, once, right, uh, for one uh, take? <laughs> and so I just didn't know enough. Yeah. But Close Encounters, I uh, lied, bad-mouthed, every actor in Hollywood to get that part because mm -hmm. I knew that it would outlive us all because it was so such a noble idea. So I used to walk by Stephen's office and say, Nicholson is crazy. <laughs> or Al Pacino has no sense of humor. <laughs> and I, would, I got the part because I said to him one day, you need a child. Yeah. And he went, you got the part. Talk to us about this new role that you're playing, this initiative that you're taking on, and, and what the turning point was for you to say America needs me and it needs a lot of people's help. I believe that history turns on individuals and not on themes, you know. And uh, we no longer teach how to run the country to the people who will be called upon to run the country. 
this is an act of national suicide. At the most, at the least, it's, it's an act of national neurosis. Um, it's like getting on a 737 and having the pilot, having someone say, we're going to pick our pilot from business class today. Yeah. You'd get off that plane. Or if the medical association said our new slogan is, you want to be a neurosurgeon? Go ahead, be a neurosurgeon. You wouldn't let the guy touch you. And yet that's what we do with the most revolutionary theory of governance in 13,000 years of history. We don't teach our kids how to run the country in any realistic way. And so, because nature abhors a vacuum, what the people don't believe they can do, which is run the country and have political power, is filled in by people it wasn't intended to be run by, people of special interests, people of questionable, um, let's say, questionable motives. The, every sovereign monarch in history has had a tutor. Alexander had Aristotle. We have no tutor unless you accept Rupert Murdoch as a tutor, and he has five passports. He's American, he's Brit, he's Australian, he's New Zealand, and he's Chinese. So when Rupert Murdoch, who owns more of the news dissemination than yeah. any other person, speaks, you have every right to be wary and cautious that he may not be thinking in your interests. Yeah. So someone has to bring civics, meaning power. That's what people believe. I don't have power, I don't have access. And as long as they're not taught that they do, they don't. And in fact, the people have all political power, all of it. And it's, it just, in a country that is bound only by ideas, the only country in the history of the world that is bound only by the ideas of the Enlightenment, of the protection of civil liberties, for instance. Every other country is bound by common ancestry, common religion, none of that. We come from everywhere and we're bound by these ideas. Unless you're taught those ideas, you're not bound and we don't teach them. Yeah. So everyone in the world knows that America is a political miracle, which is why people wake up in the morning and don't say, I can't wait to get to Finland. Mm -hmm. They say, I can't wait to get to America. Yeah. And so the Americans don't know why. And it's it's our job, job to, to teach, teach them. them. Exactly. A question for you here. If you had a chance to, to sit down and have early coffee with someone, choose anyone you wanted in the entire universe, who would it be? other than, than Jenna Jameson, <laughs> um, anyone. <clears throat> I guess uh, Aaron Burr. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because Aaron Burr is, the, uh, is a person who is considered to be the second worst traitor in the history of the country, when in fact he did absolutely nothing wrong. And during his lifetime, he was known as the first gentleman of America. And it was only Thomas Jefferson who was out to get him that he got got. And he was a gentleman. He believed he didn't have to defend himself because a gentleman never explains. That's what Jane Austen said. And he was wrong. In fact, Jefferson knew that Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton both didn't have a racial bone of bigotry in their body and that they represented his worst nightmare because he represented the Virginia slave owning class and everything he did was to support that class. One final question for you. Are you surprised that Spielberg never made it? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll end it there. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much.